All right, as you saw my attempts earlier to get online, you know that I tried to go live, but somehow the video kept freezing and dropping. So I'm gonna have to record the video and upload it, so that's what I'm doing now. So this is the Weekly Live Prophetic Word for Sunday, November 15th, 2020. Okay, let's say a word of prayer and jump right in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you thanking you for your goodness, for your kindness, for your love, for your grace. For your mercy, O oh God, I ask that you uh, speak through me in this uh, live prophetic word, O oh God, that I must decrease and you must increase. So I surrender my mind, my mouth, my hand gestures, my teeth, my tongue, everything to you, O oh God, so you can have said what you want said, so your word can be spoken and that your word can be released, uh, that you might be glorified in all things, and that the saints might be edified and the demons would be terrified and unbelievers would be challenged to turn from their own way and to turn to you. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. Uh, we're going to jump right in. Today's weekly live prophetic word is Jezebel. Today's weekly live prophetic word is Jezebel. You may or may not be familiar with that name and what it represents. So I'm going to give you a brief amount of background. We're going to read our foundational scripture and then I'm going to give it a little bit more background, then we're going to uh, just go from there. <clears throat> Our foundational scripture is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 18 through 23. Revelation, the book of Revelation, that's the last book in the Bible, last book in the New Testament, last book in the Bible, written by the Apostle John, when the Lord Jesus Christ showed him the end of this age and the beginning of the new world. God showed Apostle John everything that's going to happen for this age to come to an end, and then God's going to create a whole new everything, okay? So uh, the Lord Jesus gave that to Apostle John. Uh, Apostle John was over 90 years old when he wrote this, so it's never too late to get a vision from the Lord and never too late to fulfill your destiny. Okay, so the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 18 through 23. Verse 18, I'm reading out of the uh, King James Version. And unto the angel of the church in Athiatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach her to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Revelation 2, 18 through 23. Today's uh, weekly live prophetic word again is Jezebel. Now that's our reference scripture. Now to give you a little background on what's going on in the scripture. When John was on the island of Patmos, he had this vision of the Lord. What the Lord is doing here in Revelation 2 and 3 is he is giving grades. He's giving report cards. And a lot of people don't understand today that that is still what the Lord is doing now. The Lord is not just talking to the seven churches in Asia that John is writing to and about. It is talking to them, but not just them. The Lord is showing us one of his functions as the resurrected Savior and the mediator and the high priest is to look upon his church and give us grades, give us our report card. That's why the wise Christian asks the Lord, how am I doing? <laughs> Okay, I give a locator prophetic word at the end of every year and the beginning of every year so we can hear what God has to say about the year, what we did right, what we did wrong, what we need to work on, and what to expect in the year to come. If you look on January 1st of 2020, you will see all of the stuff that happened this year was prophesied at the beginning of the year. But the point of Revelation 2 and 3 is not just what the Spirit is saying to the church, meaning those seven churches but to the church, all of us across time, that there are lessons 
and and instructions in what the Lord said to those churches, but also he has a word for uh, the church that's alive now because part of his function as the high priest and the mediator of the new covenant that he wrote and paid for with his own blood is to give grades to his body, to give grades to the church. That's what's going on here. So the Lord is talking about specifically seven churches here that he's giving grades to what he sees, what he likes, and what he doesn't like. That's what Revelation 2 and 3 is about. So the Lord is saying he identifies himself uh, these things say that the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And he talks about different aspects of his character as he talks to each one of the seven different churches. And then he goes, I know thy works, and charity, that's another word for love, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last will be more than the first. So he starts off by talking about how he knows the good things that they're doing. Then he says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. So in other words, the Lord said, but I still have some issues with you. Even though I see you doing all this good stuff, I still got some issues with what's going on. And there's one of the, the main lessons in reading the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, that the Lord will tell you what you're doing right and what he's pleased with, but he also will tell you if he has a problem, if he has some issues, if there's some stuff going on in your life, or in your family, or in the church that he's not pleased with. Then he goes into detail. He said, notwithstanding. So in other words, just because you're doing all those good things doesn't mean that I'm just letting this other stuff slide. I see the whole picture, says the Lord. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you, because thou sufferest, that's an old English word that means allow, because you allow that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess. So in other words, the Lord's not saying that he called her a prophetess. She calls herself a prophetess. Mm. Remember I told you about self-righteous religious people, the huffy stuffies? To teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So this woman Jezebel in the church in Thyatira was a self-styled prophetess. She was leading people into sexual immorality and she was leading people to eat things that were sacrificed unto idols. And the Bible says you can't eat at the Lord's table and eat at the table of devils. You can't drink the Lord's cup, the blood of Jesus, the blood and water of Christ, and drink the cup of devils too. So in other words, the, the ritual things, the ritual sacrifices that they were bringing before the idol gods, the things that were the false gods, that this woman was teaching them it was okay to eat that stuff. And it's not okay to participate in anything that points towards idolatry and anything that calls anything God other than Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Jehovah, Jesus, Paraclete, Holy Spirit. That's God, the, the, the Word, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. <clears throat> That's God. That is all that is divine. And anything that is man-made or demon-made, anything that's not saying that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father as the spirit of Antichrist, and it's not God. And we're not supposed to be eating that kind of diet or eating things that are sacrificed in those sacrificial rituals. So the Lord said, verse 21, and I gave her space, that word space is better translated time, and I gave her time to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. So the Lord said, I've been patient, I gave her time to stop living in that sexual immorality, and she didn't. Then the Lord says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. That word dead, bed there can also be translated a bed of sickness. A bed of sickness. And he says, Then that, them that commit adultery with her. That's physical carnal adultery, meaning if you're married, you're sleeping with somebody other than your spouse, or you're sleeping with somebody else's spouse, or both but also spiritual adultery, which is you're making love to some other God except Jesus. Jesus is the bridegroom. We are the bride. We're supposed to have spiritual sexual fidelity. I know that sounds like a funny phrase, but what that means is I don't give my devotion. I don't give my worship. I don't give my tears. I don't give my adoration to anything other than Jesus. Okay, because Jesus is the one that died on the cross to save me and shed his blood. He's the one that bought me with his blood and he's my spiritual husband. So when you give that devotion, that love, 
that adoration, that affection, that, that money, whatever, to anything other than Jesus, and you pledge allegiance to something that didn't die on the cross for you, that's spiritual adultery. You're cheating on your husband. The Lord is our husband. The church, believers, saints, saved people are the bride of Christ. And when we're giving our devotion to anything other than him, we're cheating on our husband. That's spiritual adultery. Okay? So the Lord says that there's a bed of sickness and those that commit physical adultery and spiritual adultery into great tribulation. The Lord said it's going to be a lot of trouble comes in your life. Lots of trouble comes in your life if you're listening to this Jezebel spirit. If you're listening to someone that tells you that it's okay to be sexually immoral when you're a believer. If you're listening to someone that tells you that it's okay to worship something other than Jesus. The Lord says, great tribulation. Those that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So the Lord is saying, you got to turn from what you're doing. You can't keep living that way if you're a believer. The Lord said, great trouble is coming your way if you do. But the Lord said, you need to turn from your deeds. And then he says, I will kill her children with death. The Lord said, I'll kill her children. All those that follow her doctrine, everything that that spirit bursts out, God said, I'm going to kill it. That word there, death, is also translated sickness. So it's also some sickness and some pestilence coming. Okay. Uh, one more time, the Lord said, everything that that woman bursts with that false doctrine is going to get killed by Jesus. This is the New Testament. It's not the Old Testament. Okay. This is why you have to read the Bible for yourself. Um, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts. That word reins there is better, translate, better translated kidneys or guts. And what that means is that when the Lord says he searches the reins and the hearts, God looks deep on the inside of you into what really makes you tick. God does not just see what you do. God sees your motives. God sees why you do what you do. I can't tell you the number of times that the Lord has told me exactly what I was thinking. I'm in prayer. And the Lord tells me exactly what I'm really thinking. Because you can't hide from the Lord. But he says, reins and hearts. In other words, your deep emotional center. Your service emotions are the things that you let people see, stuff that you let people see in public. Your deepest emotions are buried deep inside your gut, and they always come up with tears. Anything that you feel deeply or anything that you experienced, whether it was a high or a traumatization, a triumph or a tragedy, it goes, sinks way down in your gut somewhere. And when you talk about it, you start crying because things that are buried deep inside your emotional storehouse, that's your gut. So when we have that phrase, you know, I feel something in my gut, that's what the Lord is talking about. Way down in your sub-basement where you really tick, where you really live, the Lord said, I search uh, that part of you. I search why people do what they do. The Lord says, I search who people really are and how they really feel. Okay? And then he says, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Huh, the Lord says, you can't fool me. The Lord says, I, I, I see what's really going on with you. And whatever your works are, whatever your works truly are, whatever it is that you're truly doing, not what you want people to think you're doing and not what it looks like you're doing, but who you really are deep down in your gut. The Lord says, I'm going to give every one of you according to those works. Okay? Now, to understand the significance of what the Lord is saying uh, when he calls, because thou allows that woman Jezebel in verse 20, Revelation 2.20, says you allow that woman Jezebel to understand the significance of that name. You have to understand a little bit about the real Jezebel. And when I say the real Jezebel, I mean she was actually a real woman that lived in Israel's history. So when the Lord uses this name, that might have been the actual name of the woman in the church, or the Lord may have been speaking in terms of a parable or allegory, because, you know, the Lord does that all the time. He may have been using the name Jezebel to signify the spirit that this woman was operating in. And for you to understand all that, you need to understand something about the actual historical Jezebel who lived in Bible times. Uh, I got to put this over here right quick because I'm going old school today. I'm using my actual physical Bibles for my research. <clears throat> now, the name Jezebel uh, actually means 
it, it, one possible translation means that Baal is the prince. So her very name is apostasy. That's one possible translation of the name Jezebel. Okay, uh, it, may, it, may, it may mean that Baal is the prince. Baal is one of the main false gods that Israel kept moving in a worship towards. But they kept learning it from other nations. And God kept telling them to be faithful to him, to Jehovah, to Yahweh. Because he was the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he was the God that delivered them from the bondage in Egypt. But they kept falling in love with other gods and worshiping them. And Baal was one of the main gods, one of the side gods, if you will, that Israel loved to worship. So Jezebel's name, one possible translation is Baal is the prince. So her very name is apostasy, exalting itself above Yahweh or Jehovah, the true God of heaven and the true God of the Jews and the true God of us believers, the Gentiles, under the new covenant. Okay? So uh, she lives in the book of Kings. Now, to understand the book of Kings, you have to understand that First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles is technically all one book. So they're split into three groups of two books apiece, apiece but especially uh, Samuel and Kings were all originally one book. Okay? And so what happens during the book of the Kings, First Kings opens the division, opens with the division of the kingdom. Samuel opens with the rising of Samuel. Samuel is the last prophet that led the nation. So like from Joseph through Moses to Samuel is the last time a prophet led the nation of Israel and then they went to the monarchy, okay? All that happens in First and Second Samuel where Saul rises and falls and David rises and falls. Uh, and then he passes the kingdom on to his son Solomon that he had by Bathsheba. Second Kings records the collapse of the kingdom. So in other words, it's given a historical view at how Israel moved from the system of the prophets to the monarchy and kind of the rise and fall of that whole system because remember that God told them they did not need a monarchy, but they insisted and they told them they wanted one anyway, so God let them have their way and it's one of the worst decisions they ever made. So 1 Kings records how, because they were one nation and then Solomon, listening to all his 700 wives and 300 concubines, Lord have mercy, started worshiping other gods, and God split the nation into two. He split the nation into Israel and Judah, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, okay? And they never recovered from that in Bible times, okay? And so uh, 1 Kings records that division at the end of Solomon's life, in the beginning of Rehoboam's reign, Solomon's son, and then 2 Kings records that collapse. And what ends up happening, even though God was extremely patient with them, they end up going into captivity. They end up going into Babylonian captivity where they are actually invaded and taken away from their homeland. And that's a whole other part of Israel's history. See, so that's why you kind of have to study the background to kind of understand what's going on. So Jezebel lived during this time, I'll give you exact dates, because she was married to Ahab. Ahab was a king of Israel that reigned between 874 and 853. So that's 22 years. And the prophets that were prophesying during Ahab and Jezebel's time were Elijah, Micaiah, and Elisha. All that's happening at the same time. So Elijah's prophetic works and Micaiah's prophetic works and Elisha, the successor to Elijah, all that happened during... Um, uh, Ahab, Ahaziah, and Joram, but a lot of the stuff that Elijah is famous for happened with Ahab and Jezebel, okay? All right, uh, let me see, there was another, yeah, there's some more background I wanted to give, so i got to go back to this Bible. More background I wanted to give on Jezebel. So again, the wife of King Ahab brought Baal worship from Sidon, where her father, Ethbaal, was king. So her father's name was Ethbaal, so apostasy was, apostasy was in his name too. She comes from a line of apostates. That's why God tells, told them in the Old Testament and tells us in the New Testament not to marry unbelievers. God doesn't ever want us to marry people that don't believe in him. Okay? And you see the tragic consequences in the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. So Jezebel tried to destroy all of God's prophets in Israel. All this is in 1 Kings 18. 
while installing prophets of Baal and Asherah as part of the royal household. Elijah proved these prophets to be false on Mount Carmel. That was when Elijah gathered all the prophets of Baal together and called down fire from heaven. He challenged them to a contest and said, whichever God answers by fire is the true God. So they called on Baal for like 24 hours and even cut themselves trying to make Baal answer. But Baal's a false God. And then Elijah called on Jehovah and answered by fire and burned up the altar. And then Elijah killed 150 of them prophets. Okay. After that happened, that's when Jezebel said she was going to kill Elijah for killing all his prophets. And that's when Elijah ran for his life. Okay. So there's a lot of wickedness that Jezebel did, but I also want to tell you how she died. Okay. Uh, she basically died because they threw her out the window. <laughs> She, she was dealing with Jehu, and uh, Jehu had assassinated uh, Joram because Joram was uh, Jezebel's son, and Jezebel was continuing to influence Joram. Jehu uh, was anointed by Elisha to replace Joram. Jehu assassinated Joram and then went to Jezreel after Jezebel. Jezebel tried to basically seduce him, tried to get all sexy. Uh, he didn't listen to that. And uh, so Jehu told her servants, throw her down on the street. And she threw down and she hit the wall. She hit the wall, hit her head while she was falling. And then horses uh, rode over her after her body died. And then dogs tore her. They ate her body. And there wasn't anything left but like a hand and a foot or maybe a skull or something. But Jezebel didn't have a marked grave. And that was on purpose because the prophet said, we're not even going to give Jezebel notoriety and death so people know where her grave is. Okay, so she died really hard. Okay, so this is the kind of spirit that the Lord is referring to when he talks about that woman Jezebel in Revelation 2 and 20. Okay, because again, either that woman was actually named Jezebel, but even if she was, okay, this is the background in the history of the woman that the Bible uh, understood as Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, the one that was always fighting Elijah. Okay, so, and then I'm going to tell you what that's got to do with what's going on today. So I already read to you in Revelation 2. So here it is. God is about to judge the mess out of the Jezebel spirit, starting with the church. One more time. God is about to rain judgment on the Jezebel spirit, starting with the church. How do you know the Jezebel spirit? I'll tell you how you know. The Jezebel spirit, number one, is identified here in the scripture where it's teaching you that sexual immorality is okay as a believer. It's also rebellious against the leadership of the church, okay? Because the Lord is talking to uh, the head of the church and saying, you're allowing that woman to teach? So in other words, the pastor of the church of Thyatira should have rebuked that woman, that self-styled prophetess. But she's going against the grain of leadership. And then also, when it's moving you into idolatry, it's not only moving you into sexual immorality, it's not only uh, rebellious against the leadership of the house, but it's moving you into idolatry to follow after things and to change your life to begin to worship something other than Jesus. It's also mixed with a spirit of control and usurpment. And if you want to know where that comes from, that comes from the curse God put on Eve in the Garden of Eden. And that is Genesis 3 and 16. Genesis 3 and 16, and unto the woman, he said, this was after God came upon the scene of Adam, Eve, the snake, and the devil. God cursed all four for bringing sin into this world. Genesis 3 and 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That word there, desire, is talking about a usurpment. It's talking about control. It's talking about desiring all things male. When you hear females say stuff like, that's not fair because men do it, that's that curse coming out of their mouth. Okay, because you are, in fact, not a man. But that desire to say that, uh, you know, all things male, we have to have all things male, that's a curse God put on femininity in 
uh, the book of Genesis at the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve first sinned, okay? Because we're supposed to be content with what God gave us. One more time. We're supposed to be content with what God gave us. And Eve tried to beat ahead. She threw out the word of God because she quoted the, what God said because Adam must have told her that because Eve was not there when God said it to Adam. She threw that out and she overturned the authority of her husband, went to the tree, listened to the devil, and she ate the forbidden fruit first. Eve was the first sinner on earth. Okay? She threw out the word of God. She overturned the authority of her husband, listened to the devil, and ate the forbidden fruit. Okay? Eve was not the head. So because she tried to act like she was ahead, like she could make an executive decision that just overturned what God said and overturned Adam's authority, then God locked her in that. Okay? And that God said, now your desire is going to be to your husband. Okay? So that means that usurpment, that control, all that, that's not fair because men, you never ask a man that question, because men, because men, because men, that's your curse coming out your mouth and you don't even know it because you're supposed to be content with what you are and what you have because you are in fact not a man okay and so that's where that comes from so when you see a spirit of jezebel that once again is going against the established authority of the house that is leading into sexual immorality that is teaching people to move into idolatry to move into rituals and practices and, and anything that would take the fidelity of your heart and your body and give them to something other than Jesus, the one who died for you. A spirit of control, a spirit of usurpment, okay? That is Jezebel, okay? And God is about to rain down. Well, judgment's actually already here, but judgment's going to rain down on that Jezebel spirit starting in the house of God. Okay, let me give you an example, and then let me tell you what the example leads to. Okay, let me look this up, because again, we're going old school. I'm actually physically using my Bibles, because number one, I like it, and number two, because it keeps you sharp to remember where scriptures are. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate something for you, and then I'm going to show you what the demonstration means to illustrate this point about why God is about to rain judgment on his Jezebel spirit start in the church. Here's why. Let's look at Ephesians uh, chapter 5 uh, verses 22 through 24. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 and 24. It says, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> it says, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. That is the word of God, okay? But there are many churches now today where you couldn't even read that out loud. They have thrown that out. They have said, no, it don't go like that. They don't say, no, that's not what that means. Uh, they're going to, a lot of places they start rewriting the Bible and all that. Okay, okay, that is blasphemy of the highest order. You sticking your finger in the face of God Almighty, telling him that his word isn't true. Telling the one that invented wives that he don't know how wives work. I'm just going to let that hit. Okay, and so there are some churches in America right now where you can't read, you couldn't read what I just read. Okay, that women are supposed to be subject to their husbands because the husband is the head, just like Jesus is the head of the church and he's the savior of the body. And as a church is subject to Christ, so that wives be subject to their own husbands and everything. Okay, that's what the words say. I don't care who don't like that. Okay, I don't care who, I don't care what you say and I don't care who you are because that is the word of God Almighty and I'm scared of him. I'm not scared of you. That's what the word says. And if that's what the word says, then that's the truth, and that's how it goes. But here's the deeper thing. That's what God expects to see in his family. He does not expect to see us living like unbelievers. 
So that means that, remember I told you about how the Lord gives grades from heaven? That means if the Lord is looking at Christian families and he sees us behaving in a way that doesn't align with his word, he is not pleased with that. Okay? Now I'm going to tell you what that, the deeper thing that that leads to. And here it is. There's something in the Bible called the abomination of desolation. And the abomination of desolation happens at least two times in Scripture. It happens in Daniel, and it happens in the book of Revelation. And the abomination of desolation is a phrase that means when Satan stands up in the temple or the house of God and declares himself to be God. Now, you have to understand the way Lucifer, the way Lucifer became Satan was that Lucifer tried to take over the throne from God in heaven. He said he was going to exalt his throne above God's throne. He was going to take over. And Lucifer was going to replace God as God and sovereign over all things. And God just laughed and threw his head back and kicked him out. Lucifer, Lucifer staged a coup. He convinced one third of the angels to follow him. And they started a revolution in heaven. And there was war in heaven. And I have a book series on that, by the way. Uh, it's called Lucifer, Soldier, Serpents, and Sin, where I'm talking about how the war in heaven got started. So that's what Lucifer did. He got kicked out, and he became Satan, the adversary, the enemy, okay? He went from being a beautiful anointed cherub to a twisted, gnarly, ugly, scarred dragon, a beast, a snake, okay? So when he fell to earth, ever since then, the devil has been trying to do that same thing on earth. He's been trying to come up in the house of God and establish himself as God. So when you see something called the abomination of desolation, what that means is that the devil has gotten so comfortable in the house of God that he feels like he can stand up and declare himself God above God in God's own house. That's the same thing he tried to do to heaven. That's what he's trying to do now on earth. That means the saints have become so lax. The saints have not been standing on the word of God. The saints have not been rebuking the devil and casting out demons. The saints have not been taking the sword of the spirit or the shield of faith and pushing back because the Lord said the gates of hell can't prevail against the rock that his kingdom is built on, which is the fact that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the rock that God's kingdom is built on, that Jesus he is the son of God and the son of man. He's the son of God come down from heaven and he's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one that paid the price for the sin of all time. And now is the king, and king, king of kings and Lord of lords. That's the rock that God's kingdom is built upon. And the Lord said, the gates of hell can't prevail against that. So in other words, anything in the kingdom of darkness can't win against uh, the fact that the Lord is the Lord, that Jesus is Lord, that his kingdom is built on the fact that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, King of kings, and the Lord of lords. So that means if the devil has gotten so comfortable that he can come in the house of God and stand up and declare himself God, that means the saints have just laid down like dogs. We just didn't put our tail between our legs. We didn't lay down like dogs. And let the devil do whatever he wanted to do in the house of God. That's called the abomination of desolation. And when that happens, great judgment always comes. Because God's not going to take that. God is not going to have the devil come, just like he didn't take it in heaven. He's not going to take it on earth. God is not going to have the devil come up in his house, the house of God. Remember when the Lord saw the money changers and he said, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you made it a den of thieves. The Lord took a whip and started whipping the people out of there and started overturning the money tables. Remember the Lord got violent. Because you don't come up in God's house and thwart God's purposes. This is like somebody trying to come in your house, trying to tell you how it's supposed to go up in here. It's my house. You see that? So when you see the abomina abomination of desolation, that means the devil has gotten so comfortable that he tries to establish himself as God in the house of God. And that also means the saints have gotten so lax. We have just laid down like dogs. That's why the Lord says in Revelation 2, you allow He's talking to the leader of the church of Thyatira, but he's also talking to all spiritual leaders. You allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet as she self-styled to lead people in sexual immorality, to tell the saints that it's all right to live that way if you're a Christian, to, to ignore the authority of the house, to lead people into idolatry. And it's also uh, accompanied with a spirit of control and usurpment and discontent at being what you are. All that's Jezebel. 
You can't tell me that spirit is not strong and prevalent in today's society. Well, God is about to rain judgment down. What do you mean by that, Prophet Taylor? And what does that look like? Uh, some things are going to be exposed. Some things that have been secrets for a long time going to come to light like if a woman is married and she went somewhere and slept with another man and got pregnant by that man, but came home pregnant and slept with her husband because she'd been passing the baby off as her husband's, stuff like that, okay? And uh, uh, there's going to be diseases, and there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff where God is going to uproot that spirit because God expects his daughters to live like Christian women. And the only way you can live like a Christian woman is to know what the word says and then to get the grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. Because everything in the Bible is supernatural. There's nothing in the Bible that, uh, nothing in the Bible that God expects you to do on your own strength. Everything in the Bible is supernatural. So in other words, any commandment you see in the Bible, God doesn't expect you to do that in your own power. God expects you to trust him to give you, he's going to open his hand and give you the grace. So there's going to be, some states are going to adopt uh, mandatory DNA testing policies so that when children are born, there would no longer be a situation where a man that is not biologically the father is still legally on the hook for that child because that is unjust. The man that fathered the child needs to be on the hook for the child, not making another man pay because the woman went, woman went somewhere else and cheated and didn't tell her husband or the man is not responsible. If she was sleeping with a whole bunch of men, that the court just, just you know, nails one man and he not the daddy. Now, all that's going to be overturned. And, and, and like I said, there's going to be various sicknesses and diseases and, and uh, a lot of the disrespect that has been shown. Uh, male leadership and husbands and fathers is going to be overturned because that is not biblical. Okay? I don't care what society around us said. That ain't what God said. And God's, God expects us to live by what he said. A lot of that is going to be, there might be even more widespread divorce as people are, are breaking up, as people are realizing they don't want to go forward because they're not living with that Jezebel spirit. Um, and like the Lord said in Re Revelation 2.20, he's going to kill the children with death. And what that means is that people, and he's going to uh, uh, cast her to a bed, then they commit adultery with her great tribulation. So it's going to be a lot of trouble for people to follow that Jezebel spirit and doctrine. And verse 23, 223, I will kill their children with death and all the churches shall know I'm he which searches the brains and the hearts. So in other words, God is saying he's going to judge and punish people that follow that doctrine and perpetuate it. And you're going to get sick and you're going to die. And the Lord is going to, this great fear is going to come upon the church, just like when Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead in the book of Acts. When people realize that you don't play with Jesus, that you don't play with the Lord, that you don't play with the blood of Jesus, that this is not a joke and this is not a game. And all the people that want to follow that doctrine of disrespecting the leadership and sexual immorality and following idols and commit adultery against the Lord, the, the Lord is not playing games. Okay, and all that is fitting to rain down in buckets. You haven't seen what's about to happen. I'm going to say it one more time. You haven't seen what's about to happen. Another thing that's going to happen is a lot of women are going to lose their protection. What do I mean by that? There's a lot of things that women are protected of because men defend them. Okay, but we have two generations of women that have never lived in an America where men didn't defend them. What would you do if you screamed and nobody moved? What would you do if something happened to you and you screamed and you hoped a man heard you and men was just like, oh, they just step back and let you fight for yourself? Mm -hmm. A lot of men are going to do, they just going to step back. They're going to step back. A lot of women have been confessing for years that they were strong and independent and they didn't need men. That is not what God said. That should not be coming out of the mouth of a Christian woman that you were strong and independent, you didn't need men because you at least needed your father to exist. You may not need a husband, but you certainly needed your dad because you're the seed of your father growing in the womb of your mother. 
But that kind of disrespect to men and male leadership and all that, coming out of the mouth of Christians, God doesn't expect unbelievers to listen to him because they are by definition unbelievers. But we're not supposed to be saying anything other than what the words say. And when all that disrespect and all that disrespect for God's divine order, one more time, that's the Jezebel spirit. Disrespect for God's divine order. Christ, man, woman, children. Christ is the spiritual head. On earth, men are the head. Women are in the submissive position. Children are in the obedience position. The reason that carnal, unbelieving people don't understand that is because those positions are not based on worth. They're based on function. That's like saying your feet are worth less than your hands because they're lower on your body. That's not true. <laughs> That's like saying your ears are worth less than your eyes because your ears are on the side of your head and your eyes are in front of your head. That's not true. That's not a matter of worth. That's a matter of function. What if your liver is saying, I don't want to be the liver no more. I want to be the lungs. You can't breathe through your liver, not like through your, your lungs. And your lungs, do, your lungs do filter, but they don't filter the poison like your liver does. But your liver is not worth less or more than your lungs. It's not either or, it's both and. It's not your feet or your hands, it's both and. It's not your eyes and your ears, it's both and. So what I'm saying that to say is I know, I'm thinking of somebody right now, there are harsh critics of God's divine order because they keep saying that women being in a submissive position means that, that Christianity is trying to say that women are worth less than men. That's not possibly true. You know how that's not true? Because Jesus paid the same price for everybody. He didn't die once for women and then once for men. He died one time for everybody. That means he paid the exact same price for you regardless of gender. That is not a question of worth because there are many things that God has gifted women with that only women can do. And same with men. It's not a question of worth. It's a question of function. When you come into this world, you are a child. You need to be in the obedience position because you know the least. You don't even know not to stick your finger in a light socket that that will kill you. You don't know that every smile, every, you don't know nothing. You can't take care of yourself, can't feed yourself, can't change your, you can't do nothing. All you can do is cry and ask mom and daddy to do it. You're in the obedience position until you grow up and they release you to be an adult, to go build your own life. Okay? So once again, Christ is the spiritual head. Men are the head. Women are in the submissive position. Children are in the obedience position. That's God's divine order as laid out in scripture. I don't care who doesn't like it. They are blasphemers telling God Almighty that he did it wrong. And as a Christian, you don't have no business listening to blasphemers for your theology. You don't have, don't have no business listening to people outside of the kingdom of God that don't know the Lord and don't know the scriptures trying to tell you how the family is supposed to be built because the family is God's invention. Do you understand that? Do you understand that God made the family? God made mankind in his own image and then he split them split mankind into two genders, and the only time during the creation process where God said something was not good, so when he looked at Adam alone, he said it's not good that the man should be alone. Then he took part of his substance and made Eve and made the first family, and then God said, very good. So when you put your mouth on something that God created and he pronounced very good, you are a blasphemer telling God Almighty that he did it wrong. Telling God Almighty, don't no, see, it don't go like that. You are an arrogant, idolatrous blasphemer. Trying to say that the maker don't know what he's talking about. Okay? And if you are a Christian, you don't have any business listening to that. Let the world have that. Let people that are not born again, people that don't know the Lord and don't know the scriptures and don't have the Holy Ghost. You realize it works the way the Lord said it works. The reason they can't get revelation on scripture is because they don't have the Holy Ghost. It's the spirit of God that helps us understand the Bible, not us. The Bible's not stood, understood by intellectualization. It's understood by revelation, meaning God does that. He pulls the cover off. The Holy Ghost is the one. That's why you understand the scripture. And people that are not born again do not have the Holy Ghost. So of course, they're going to disparage it. Of course, they're going to say all kinds of things that they say, but none of that is true. Because God is true, and every man is a liar. And as believers, we're supposed to be listening to our Heavenly Father and our Bridegroom, our Savior, the one that died to redeem us, Jesus, not any other voice except for that of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And for people that don't want to hear that and people that don't believe that, then judgment is fixing to reign 
down and it's going to be ugly and it's going to be brutal. You think this year has been something. You think COVID has been something. Where do you see this? Because the Lord already told you what he thinks about allowing a Jezebel spirit to operate in his house. He already told you he's going to give you time to repent. If you don't repent, he said, I'm coming with judgment. I'm coming with tribulation. I'm coming, throwing you in a bed of sickness. I'm coming with pestilence and I'm coming with death. That's right there in the scripture. I just read it to you. I'm not making that up. That's why I read the scripture. People say, oh, that prophesying, that's just you talking. Not when I read it right out the Bible. Okay? So that's what I mean when I tell you when the Spirit of God wants to let you know that, that this bill about to come due, that this time is up, that this game is over. Okay? That God expects his daughters to live, and his sons, of course, God expects his daughters to live according to what the scriptures say, not according to what the world say. And God is about to come get this mess out of his house. And it's not going to be pretty. So I would advise those of you that are listening to me, listening to this video, listening to the podcast, or however you experience it, I would advise those of you to go before the Lord and ask for your grace. Ask Jesus, how am I living? Are you pleased with how I'm living? Are you pleased with what you see? Yes or no. And if the Lord is not pleased with what he sees, then ask him to show you how to repent or to turn from a lifestyle that's not pleasing to him and turn to something that would be pleasing to him. That's where people go all off the deep end. They don't have an actual relationship with the Lord, so they go from one extreme to another. Like if, uh, if uh, a woman wants to incorporate modesty into her dress, she goes so hard towards modesty that she gets frumpy. You know, no makeup and, and frumpy hairstyles and a whole bunch of stuff. And, you know, many times that's not really necessary, but you have to ask the Holy Spirit to let you know, how do you want me to carry myself as a woman of God? How do you want me to dress? What's, what's right in your eyes? That kind of thing. That's why you need a relationship with the Lord. That's why you hear me say it every time. This only comes by relationship with three levels of word. The written word, the Bible, the living word, Jesus, and the prophetic word, the rainbow word, the fresh breeze right now word that comes out of the mouth of God. Okay? Because God does not give no one person all the revelation. I just listened uh, to several pastors this morning. Because God does not give no one person all the revelation. God didn't even write the Bible that way. How, how, how can people think that one person is going to just have everything and God did not write the scriptures that way? God used many authors over thousands of years to write what we have as a completed canon of scripture. If God didn't write the Bible that way, what makes you think there's only one prophet or only one prophetic word or one pastor or whatever it is that people think? Yeah, no. What happens is that God gives each one of us a piece of revelation, a part of revelation, a section of revelation, a view, a window, okay, each one of us. And then when you listen to that which is anointed and preached, prophesied, and taught, you can get a clearer and clearer picture. And you also need to know how to get a prophetic word from the Lord yourself. That's why you hear me say all the time that you need to be walking in the prophetic for yourself because you need a word from the Lord for yourself, okay? You need to know how to get that, okay? All right, so let me ask all the goes. Is there anything else he wants me to say before we wrap up? Okay. Okay, the Holy Ghost uh, spoke to me the word of fear. There's two kinds of fear. There's the crippling kind of fear that paralyzes you, like when a lion roars and the deers and the gazelles get so afraid from that war, they freeze and they forget to run. And then there's a kind of fear of respect and awe and reverence. God wants you to have godly fear, which is when you hear the word of God, you respect the Lord, you reverence the Lord. The same way if your parents yelled at you and they said, stop making all that noise back there or cut out all that, that loud playing or whatever you're doing, you gotta respect daddy's voice. If you don't respect daddy's voice, he's coming back there with some judgment, okay? But it's not the fear of being crippled or paralyzed. I'm so scared, I don't know what to do. 
okay? Because the fear that God wants you to have is the fear that makes you turn from your wrong ways, any way that's not pleasing to Jesus. God wants you to fear him and respect him and honor him and turn from what you're doing and turn to the way he wants you to live. Not to be so paralyzed and so crippled that you can't think, and I don't know what to do, so I'm just not going to do nothing because I can't function. Not that. That's toxic fear. The fear of respect and reverence and, and, and fear in God's judgment. I don't want to get a whipping. I don't want to get taken out of here too early. I don't want to miss my destiny because I'm disobedient. That's healthy fear. The same way, it's, God says it in the scripture. God said, you feel your, your mortal father, your natural dad. If your natural dad's going to chastise you, God said, you're supposed to fear me too in that way. But not the paralyzing, crippling, I can't make a decision fear. Not that, that's toxic. But the fear of my father has spoken and so I need to respect it. I need to reverence. I need to, to, to get my behind in order, lest my father come with judgment and chastisement and whipping and sickness and tribulation. And I ended up dying early and I never got to live out my destiny because I wouldn't, I wouldn't live the way he wanted me to live. That's what that means. So what you're feeling right now, if you're feeling fear right now, let it be the fear that makes you turn to God and turn to God's ways and turn from anything that's not pleasing in his sight. That's the proper response to what I've been saying. If you're paralyzed and that's toxic, that's not from God because you can't even make a decision when you're scared to death like that. So you understand the difference? Okay. All right. I think that's it. All right. So amen and God bless. Ooh, okay. Wait, no, there's something else the Holy Ghost wants me to release. Hold on. Mm. For behold, my people, I come and I come swiftly. And I come as I have spoken in the scripture and by the mouth of my prophet. I come to judge. I come to cleanse. I come to separate the wheat from the chaff. I come to separate those from who are truly serving me and those who are not. And my reward is with me. And I will give unto every one of you according to your words. Because I'm the one that tries the reins and the hearts. I see all that there is to see. And I will judge accordingly right now with a swiftness with no more delay, says the Spirit of the living God. Wow. Okay, just wow. Okay, so the Lord, I told you, I told you it's not coming, it's here. Okay, so don't be surprised in the days and weeks to come if you start seeing some unusual things happening along this order. Because the Lord didn't already told us what's about to happen. Okay? So if I were you, I would go before the Lord and humble myself and ask, tell Jesus, I want to repent of anything that's not pleasing in your sight and let the Lord show you what he likes and what he doesn't like, what he wants and what he doesn't want. Otherwise, judgment is about to sweep through. All right? All right. Amen and amen. That's it for this week. Um, remember, I told you if the, uh, if the, uh, anything's going on with internet stuff, then, um, then, uh, uh, I will upload the video. So look for the YouTube link. If I can't do it live, I'll still make the video, um, because I still want to release the prophetic word. Don't forget to get my prophetic devotional. We still have some time left in this year. So you can get a, uh, study a word about prophecy every day and have the Holy Spirit explain it to you. Uh, and I will be here next Sunday. I did No More Genies. I actually did it live in my car because <laughs> I was out and I knew I wasn't going to be able to get home on time, so I actually did No More Genies in my car. So that last video that you see, that's why it looks all funny because I'm in my car. We talked about uh, Bible studies. We talked about basic principles of Bible study. So check that out. That's on both my YouTube channel and on my Facebook Live page. So yeah, so if I, I'm not live, if something happened with the internet or whatever, I will always just record the video and upload it so you can get your weekly prophetic word. I'll be here same time next week, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. Okay? Amen. God bless. And remember that it's time for us to get rid of any type of Jezebel operation in our life. Repent from any of that and turn to living the way the Lord expects his children to live according to his word. Amen and amen.